Hi, Dan. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? I am doing just great. Looking forward to speaking with you. Well, I, I am looking forward to this, too. Why don't you introduce yourself? So I'm uh, Daniel Kaufman. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University, and I also host the Sophia program on uh, Meaning of Life TV. Uh, and um, I'm a family man, yada, 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 that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But those are the relevant things. <laughs> Fine, upstanding citizen. I'm I, sure I should hope so. Many people would attest to that. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. And I'm glad you mentioned your show, Sophia, because uh, if there's anybody out there who has not subscribed to the Sophia podcast and is interested in uh, philosophical questions, um, and for that matter, more broadly, meaning of lifey questions, I guess, or maybe more narrowly, I'm not sure which it is, um, they should. They should subscribe to your show. Uh, it's great. And, I appreciate and, that. And... Um, now, this is a kind of unusual show we're having here. It originated uh, in a comment you made um, in, the, in the comments forum on Meaning of Life TV. Uh, and and the, the discussion generally was, I guess, the meaning of, meaning of life. And what you said is specifically, I think that you, meaning me, look for meaning and purpose in the wrong place and with too great a literalness. That is, you are looking for it in the world as opposed to understanding that it consists instead in our distinctive capacity to engage in certain kinds of interpretations of the world. Now, um, so we're going to kind of explore this and um, see where we do disagree. Let me just start out by saying there's um, two things th that may or may not distinguish our, our worldviews. First of all, I, d I would not personally equate Wait, the meaning question and the purpose question. Maybe you were just kind of being casual here. It kind of suggests that you are. And then the other thing is, uh, when we're talking about meaning in particular, people search for the meaning of life. I wouldn't, you know, say as you did to anybody, you're looking for it in the wrong place. I mean, my, my, I, I kind of, uh, like if somebody says to me, I find meaning in the meaning of my life lies in looking at the sunset. I'm like, fine, it works for you. If somebody says, I find meaning in the fact that uh, I believe my life has been given a purpose from some transcendent source. I'm like, fine, that works for you. You're both looking for it in the right places in the sense that it works for you. Now, if somebody says, I find meaning in a purpose given to me by a God that created the earth 6,000 years ago, then, then they are attaching it to a truth claim, and then I might start arguing with them. But generally speaking, do you, do you really uh, think it makes sense to talk about a right and a wrong place to look for meaning? Okay, so the, the first thing um, regarding meaning and purpose, um, I, I, I'm at somewhat of the disadvantage of, of, of trying to infer or deduce what, is, what it is you're getting at um, um, with respect to purpose. Um, more that I, I, I've noticed how often in your discussions, it comes up that you try to press the person that you're talking to uh, to see if they can uh, make make use of or room for any kind of notion of purpose in the world. Um, and so, I'm interested in why that's that's such a persistent something that you persistently push. And I thought it might be connected to your interest in the question of meaning, just because of other it's things connected. that you've said. It is. It is connected. Uh, um, so that's the reason that I invoke that, um, um, and we can talk about the connection between those things. The other thing, um, yeah, don't, don't I, you know, don't take looking in the wrong place too serious. I mean, I guess I mean it more. I, I'm I'm approaching this purely from a philosophical perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if someone tells me that they think that beauty is an objective property of the world. I'm going to say, well, that's the wrong place to look for beauty. Beauty is in is in is in perception. It's an inherently subjective property mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it's it's perceiver dependent, right? Mm -hmm. The notion of beauty mm -hmm. existing independent of any perceivers of beauty strikes me as being uh, a, 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 a dubious, philosophically speaking. So when I say the wrong place, I mean it in that sort of framework. Uh, any but. I, I'm not in the habit of going around and telling people where they should go, how they should go about making their lives meaningful. But in a sort of a philosophical or an intellectual conversation, if I think that something is inherently a subjective characteristic or property, 
and somebody else thinks it's an objective one, I might say, well, in that sense, you're looking for the thing in the wrong place. But it wasn't meant in a normative sort of sense, right? Okay. Um, um, so. And I would certainly agree that a search for meaning involves interpretation um, in the in, in the end, although maybe you're saying a little more than that. Okay, so with that, with that kind of aside, um, I think you, you know, you have some questions about my worldview. I mean, I mean, it's, it's um, about my, the way I frame the meaning of life. Sh should I kind of say some things that I think are relevant to the way I think you're perceiving it? Or should you like ask me a question? Um. Well, I mean, the, the, what we've already started off with, I am interested to know what your interest in is in finding the degree to which we can talk about purpose mm -hmm. separate from human purposes. That mm -hmm. is, purposes independent of our distinctive mm -hmm. purposes and interests. Yeah. Um, so you could start off that way if you want. Okay. I mean, one thing, one thing I would say is, you know, when you see me have these conversations on Meaning of Life TV, part of what I'm doing is kind of anthropology. I, I mean, I'm just exploring people's worldviews. And it certainly, there's a long tradition, perhaps more in the West than in the East, but a long tradition of people finding the meaning of their lives in the belief that their life has a purpose that is that that derives from some transcendent source or some larger source, um, uh, you know, and often a, a theistic source in in the West. Right. Um, so uh, that's maybe one reason I. I asked the question. I'm also very interested in it. And maybe that's partly because I was brought up in a, in a Western religious tradition. I was brought up Christian. Um, I, so I don't know exactly why I'm so interested in it. But I guess my, my, my view of the connection between meaning and purpose is there's lots of uh, places you could look for meaning and, and places you could plausibly find it. I mean, you may have noticed I also spend a lot of time talking to people about Buddhist philosophy and meditation. And that, yes. that, that doesn't involve that. That's a, that's a that's a place to look. That's what the book I'm finishing is about. And that and there's no reference in that book to, you know, externally. Uh, yeah, that's a distinct, purpose. That seems like a distinct set of interests of yours. Um, um, you had me, you know, when I asked you this through the email, you had me go and look at an older interview with you did with Dan Dennett. Right. Um, which I actually do recommend to people. That was awfully interesting. Um, and you had enough time there that you could really get into a lot. Um, right. I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, but there it did seem to seem that you were actually wanting to make a case um, for yeah. there being purpose in nature. Yeah, I've, I've made the uh, argument. I, I don't, I've made the argument in my book, Non-Zero, kind of alluded to it again in my book, The Evolution of God. I, I don't think I've ever made it as clearly and explicitly as I should, at least judging by the number of misconceptions I encounter about it, among the few people who have any awareness of it, that is. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there is, um, I, I think you can talk about there being evidence of purpose in, in I, mean, I mean, if you ask, well, the first thing I'd say is purpose doesn't have to involve spooky forces, okay? One can say that there is a purpose working itself out through the workings of nature without saying that there's anything non-materialistic, as some scientists might put it, or non-material or, or anything um, beyond the laws of uh, science driving the system in an immediate sense, okay? Just, just, as, just as if I say this, uh, this pocket watch has a purpose, I'm not saying that, that, that you need to refer to the purpose to explain, uh, you know, its workings in an immediate sense. It's a mechanistic system. It's we can explain its workings in terms of engineering and science. So uh, that's the first thing I would emphasize because that's the first misconception I get is that if I say I think there's reason to think that there's a, a purpose working itself out through kind of biological and then human cultural evolution on this planet, people think. No, wait a second. I just think natural selection can explain how evolution works. And I go, yes, I know that. I, be, I agree. That, but, but that's not the question I'm asking. So does that make sense to you? Well, look, I mean, a lot of this will rest on what you mean by spooky, right? So, I mean, yes, I think that one can ascribe purpose to nature without it being 
personified, in other words, that is without it depending upon an agent, right, an intending agent, certainly look, you go all the way back to Aristotle. Well, okay, but I should be clear. I'm not saying it It doesn't, you know, like, uh, if if some, you know, either superhuman being started off natural selection with this in mind, so to speak, uh, it would still be a materialist system working itself out. Or for that matter, if we're in a giant computer simulation and the algorithm of natural selection is kind of part of it in a sense, but it's some giant hacker that started it, th there would be, in that case, an intending agent. So I'm I, that's not the distinction I'm making, okay? I'm not saying uh, there couldn't be a god. The, the thesis that natural selection... Uh, uh, and the and subsequent cultural evolution manifest a purpose is compatible, for example, with a deism, right? A god yeah, that wound the universe up and then kept yeah, hands yeah, off. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so now that's not the only scenario that I think is compatible with this being a purposeful system. But, 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 but I just want to emphasize: I'm not distancing. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not dis making that distinction. Okay, I'm, I'm not. Well, but when people, but, but when people complain about purpose being spooky. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the reason they complain is because they think it requires invoking some sort of spooky actors or spooky agents. Um, and, and I'm agreeing with you. It need not presuppose any such thing. Um, Aristotle ha believes that nature has purpose in it, and it's not due to any kind of anthropomorphic uh, intending sort of deity. Right. What I was going to get at, though, is that there is a sort of a, a, a thinner, weaker version of spooky, where what you mean is, yeah, but you can't get purpose in nature without some sort of metaphysics, some sort of uh, r robust metaphysics. And that's certainly true for, for Aristotle, um, that he thinks there's pur purpose in nature in a very thick sense, in a very rich sense. Um, and um, there, the, it, it at least requires, it seems to me, some sort of essentialism, right? right? Because to say that something has a purpose presupposes that it has a sort of a defining or an essential property, right? Um, from which the purpose is then read off, right? That's, that's how Aristotle... From which the purpose is inferred. Right, right. Yes. Form for, for, formal cause versus final cause. I'm not cause. sure I'd use the term essence, but yes, some property or set of properties that, that you think makes it plausible to suspect that a purpose has been imparted, yes. Right, and so, and, and historically in philosophy, those have been called essential properties, okay. and that's been called essentialism. And at least in the 20th century, um, essentialism has come under a lot of criticism. And so, um, and, and it's unclear that it's sustainable um, 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 that things have essential properties um, uh, uh, in, in a sort of sense that they have them independent of any uh, human uh, conception of them. Yeah. Um, and, so, and so this goes along with the question of whether there are actually natural kinds, whether there are actually kinds. Well, I'm, very, I'm very skeptical of essentialism uh, in that sense as well. Right. And I, I, I don't see my argument as depending on it. I don't see how you get purpose without essentialism. Well, let, let, me, put it, let me put it this way. Uh, so, you know, Richard Dawkins' book, The Blind Watchmaker, Sure. So it's about this, this I guess, what, 17th or 18th century the, uh, theologian, um, William Paley, who, who engaged in what's called natural theology, which is kind of, well, I guess if, if what I'm doing is natural teleology, it's kind of related. It That is to say, seeing in studying nature and finding in it, uh, in Paley's case, signs of God. That's natural theology. And he made an argument that Dawkins correctly, I think, critiques. And Paley's argument is, look, if you walk through a field and you see a rock, you know, you don't have reason to go, wait a second, what designed that rock? It's just a rock. On the other hand, if you see a pocket watch, I think yeah. that's the example he used, and you look at how intricately it's functioned, blah, 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 then you have reason to suspect that it had a designer. And he says, now suppose you run into an animal, a squirrel or something. Well, which category does that fall in? Is it more like a rock or is it more like a watch? And he said, look, it's more like a watch. It has evident functionality. It's good at doing certain things. It's good at eating. It's good at it, blah, blah, blah. Has all these organs with obvious functions. It seems to be a product of design. And here's what Dawkins said. And this part is correct, I think. He said, uh, Paley was correct to put the organism in the same category as the pocket watch. It is, in some sense, a, a product of a creative process that creates, in some sense, purpose. Now, 
purpose can be defined any ways. If you want to call this a kind of purpose that's in quotes, fine, but you know what we mean. What Dawkins is getting at is that natural selection uh, does, you know, first of all, the, the inference is correct. This thing demands a special kind of explanation. Paley was just wrong about what the explanation was. Paley thought it was created directly by a god. Dawkins is saying we now know that natural selection is uh, is the creative process, but 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 Paley was right in the way he categorizes. So what Dawkins is saying is it is possible and legitimate to inspect a physical system and ask, does it have the hallmarks of design? Leaving aside the question of whether the designer might be an actual intelligent agent or just a process of selection that winds up creating things that look, you know, functional, okay? Leaving that aside, it is legitimate to inspect the physical system and say, I think it's more like a rock, or no, I think it has hallmarks of, of either design or design in quotes, okay? What I'm saying, he, Dawkins is completely right so far, what I'm saying is, if you look at the whole system on this planet, of evolution and subsequent human cultural evolution, I'm arguing that that has properties that make it plausible, at least, to put it in that category of things that, that demand some kind of explanation, okay? And uh, it's at this point that I start losing people, I think, but that, that's the, you, you see kind of the structure of the argument. I'm agnostic as to whether the, the, the evidence I would point to um, indicates some kind of intelligent uh, being like a god uh, or, or what. By the way, at this point, just an asterisk, the reason I took pains to say this doesn't involve spooky forces, what I was mainly trying to distinguish this from is so-called intelligent design, okay? No, no, not that. Okay, now back to where we were. Do you, do you, do you get kind of... Well, uh, I'd like to ask one more thing um, as a qualifier. We... we, we, we um... Darwin, and then and then I, and then I might have some things to ask you. Um, so so one of the very common understandings of Darwin is that Darwin made it possible to explain the appearance of design where there really isn't any. Okay. Um, what if I were to change that and say Darwin also explains why there's the appearance of purpose where there really isn't any? Um, what, would, what would be your reaction to that? My reaction would be it's a question of how you want to define purpose. And philosophers differ. Now, Dan Dennett, as I think you saw in that video, he's he's willing to use the word purpose, and he's a philosopher taken seriously, uh, with, yeah, with respect to animals. He says natural selection imparts purpose to animals, and we don't need to come up with a new word. Now, if you want to come up with a new word and say there's purpose when we know it was designed by an intelligent being and purpose with an asterisk or purpose you know, or a whole new word or whatever, purpose in quotes, let's say. Right. You want to call it purpose in quotes when we know um, it was created by a process that is itself not intelligent but still creates things in a systematic way that have functionality and, and structural integration and so on and look as if they were designed. That's fine. If you want to use two different terms, what I would say is, my argument about the whole about the whole system of life on the planet is at a stage where I'm agnostic as to whether what the, the answer would be is purpose or purpose in quotes. I'm yeah. just saying there's reason to suspect at least one or the other. Yeah. So, so you know, it may not matter. You know, a lot of this, a lot of whether I quote unquote care about this will have to do with how you want to deploy the concept of purpose. That is what your interest is in it and what you want to do with it. Um, otherwise, you know, I may, I may decide that, oh, well, in that sense, the concept's harmless, or I might then want to harp on it, depending upon what, what you want to use it for. I mean, I will say that I don't know that I think the rock and the watch case are as clear cut as people might like to think. Um, and this is, this, this has to do with part of my, uh, in, in, instinctive feeling that ascriptions of purpose are all the result of the ascriber interpreting things in various ways um, um, and that to talk of them as being inherently purposeful I, makes a kind of category error as a kind of category error um, I could just as easily look at a rock and think of all sorts of things it would be great for and all sorts of things it would not be suited for in terms of functions yeah but the right? point is the rock would still exist even if it weren't great for those things the pocket watch would not exist if it were not good at what it's doing 
and the the organs and so on that constitute an organism would not exist if they weren't good at doing what they're doing. So you can imagine things that a rock or a, or a snowflake or anything else could be put could be used for, but the characteristic of things that have either purpose or purpose in quotes is that they would not even exist as you in the form that you see them in if they weren't good at doing it. Um, this may depend on bio knowledge in biology that I don't have. I was well, under, do you think a squirrel? I was would... under the impression that there, that we had all sorts of superfluous parts that aren't particularly good at doing anything, right? We have some, but you, but with any animal, it's 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 possible to point to things that just would not exist. I mean, you would not have a stomach if it were not a valuable part of uh, digesting food. You would not have eyes yeah, if they did yeah. not perceive things and help steer yeah, you through yeah. the world. Yeah, and and I do I do agree to the to the following extent that you really can't intelligibly talk about stomachs or hearts or things like that without talking about what they're for. Um, um, and you know, right. and to that sense, this is part of the reason why there's some, been some difficulty in reducing biology to lower level uh, sciences because pur purpose or function seems to be an ineliminable explanatory concept in biology. And it, whereas it's, it's, it is, needs to be eliminated when you get down to the le level of chemistry and physics. And so I certainly think that that's the case. Um, I, I would agree with you with that, about that. And if that's really all that you mean by function or purpose, then I probably don't have any sort of problem with it. I would then want to know what – I would then want to say, okay, there is such a thing. Why is that interesting? How do you don't, deploy this concept? I mean, do you, don't, you think, don't you think it's, it's an interesting question whether – the whole evolutionary process that created us was or was not itself created by, you know, either an intelligent being or some kind of meta natural selection process, which you can imagine, by the way, and I can get to that if you want, these kinds of cosmic uh, natural selections involving multiple universes. And so we could talk about that. But don't you think that's just an interesting question? I mean, maybe it's just me. Yeah, no, no, but no, 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 no. I don't mean, when I say interesting, I don't mean it like, like that. What I mean is more is, how how do you want to what what is what, how do you want to deploy this concept? So let's just stipulate that there is a, that there is purpose in this sense, um, and let's remain uh, sort of uh, uh, agnostic over whether it where it comes from. Ultimately, mm -hmm. um, what is your? I meant more. What is your interest in the concept? Is this supposed to connect up with how you talk about meaning? Is it supposed to connect up with with um, some of the stuff you talked with uh, Pinker about, about moral progress. What What is, how are you going to use the concept now that you've got it? Let's say we accept it. Mm -hmm. All right, what's its significance? Well, what I, I would just say, I mean, first of all, I would say if we discovered that there's some kind of cosmological natural selection uh, process that led to us, or discovered that there's some kind of, there was some kind of deistic God, I'd, I'd say that's just so interesting that, you know, I, I'd, I'd uh, uh, you know, call it a day, but, but, but. I, I think as for my interest, I, I think I think there was more than that. I mean, I grew up being taught that there's a God, and maybe that's why I remain interested in the... I, I grew up uh, being taught that humanity had a purpose, imparted from the beyond. So maybe that's why I'm still interested in the question. Um, <clears throat> that is... Uh, I don't think I'm alone there. Uh, at the same time... Um, I think there are a lot of people who aren't interested in the question. In a way, this gets back to, to my kind of saying, look, look for meaning anywhere you find it. There are people who I think would like to think, would find life more meaningful if they believe, believe that it is, is in some sense the purpose of humankind to, for example, progress morally. And this will, will lead us to the other thing you brought up, because I do think they're connected. I mean, I do think there's a, there are kinds of directionality in evolution, and that's one reason to suspect purpose. And one of the kinds of directionality in human cultural evolution is a certain kind of uh, moral uh, directionality. But anyway, there, there are people who, who say, um, whose lives would be enriched by believing that in any sense, this, this moral direction, uh, and by inference, the role that each of us can play in sustaining it, uh, is part of a purpose imparted from beyond. Now, there's people who aren't interested in that question, and that, that just gets back to my fact that, like, I'm agnostic on where you find meaning. But if the answer to this question helps people find meaning, uh, uh, 
fine, good. I, I guess, I guess I can say that it, for me, maybe it does. Maybe that's why I grapple with it. I mean, it's certainly a meaningful question to me, but, uh, but I would argue it's just intellectually interesting in any event. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, don't, and I, and I certainly don't mean to dismiss matters of purely intellectual interest, which I shouldn't, given my profession. <laughs> um, 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 uh, it's just that um, when I when I think about meaning and purpose, it ge I generally tend to my mind tends to turn to sort of social, moral, evaluative, normative sort of the norm those dimensions of our lives. Um, I don't. I don't think of it very often in terms of my conception of nature independent of all that. Right. Um, to me, um, it's just, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess if we found out there was some deistic prime mover, it would be, it would be interesting. I don't know. I actually don't know what would, how one would find such a well, thing out. Well, maybe, um, maybe but, the interesting question is if you, if you became convinced that the evidence is overwhelming, that these either purpose or purpose in quotes. So you don't know what it is. Does that itself enrich your life? You know, uh, I don't know. That's that's an interesting question too. Yeah, I mean, because look, the notion that individuals have purposes mm -hmm. is completely uncontroversial. I mean, that's just a, a basic feature of human life. Um, but you're right that a lot of people think that those individual purposes are only really significant or meaningful if they in some way uh, uh, cohere with or 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 fall under some larger purpose that's not at the individual level and that's not created by the individual um, but comes from some outside place. Mm -hmm. um, now, I personally have to say that has never been compelling to me, um, um, I, and I, I frankly have never even quite understood it. Um, well, were you were you brought up with with a very theistic, explicitly theistic religion? No, because, you know, I, you know, you've probably heard more of this than you want to hear. I mean, just with all the stuff on Judaism recently, um, um, uh, most Jews don't think like that. Right. Even the religious ones y um, 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 don't think really all that much like that. Um, right. We're very immersed in the, the social framework. Um, oh, right. Well, I mean, Jewish identity is, is kind of distinctive, as you and, and, and your rabbi discussed yeah, recently yeah, and, and yeah, Sophia. Yeah. So, so it has, um, you know, it has uh, sources of like congealing or something that, that, that are independent of theistic belief in a way that Christianity doesn't. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. a Jewish friend of mine once uh, recently, he's probably somebody you know or have heard of, he kind of writes and stuff, and uh, he he called me a Christian, knowing that I no longer hold the beliefs of Christianity. And I realized he thinks it's like, you know, that it's like, it's, it's like Jewishness. It's not. <laughs> right, if you right. quit believing this stuff, you're not a Christian, okay? Right. These are different uh, kinds of things. And one thing this kind of gets at is that um, when we talk about higher purpose, there's also separate from that... Um, kind of larger purpose in the sense of social purpose. One way that people get meaning is just being part of a group of people who have any kind of purpose. And it can be identify, an identification with a nation, with an ethnic group, with an athletic team. And there is that. And, and I think congregations can have that, can have that independent of theistic belief. But I think with Christianity, the theistic belief is more connected to the congregational unity than it is with at least most variants of Judaism. Yeah. And I probably in Christianity, you'd even want to make distinction. So the belief, the theistic belief is the most important in some of the Protestant forms. I suspect that I know a lot of Italian and Irish Catholics whose religious affiliation is a lot more like mine than like evangelical Protestants that I know. Um, um, for them, it's very cultural. Yeah. The, the Irish and the Catholic bleed in together. They're not, right. they don't separate cleanly. Right. Um, and quite, and, um, partly because these have been the national religions of these countries for so long. Right. Right. That, um, that they bleed into the culture. So I, I think, you know, I think you're actually right, absolutely right about that. You know, one of the things that other things I want, you know, now that we've talked about purpose a little bit, I'd be interested in knowing a little bit more about what you mean by meaning. Um, because I'm not sure that that that's entirely clear to me. And, um, you know, you've been asking a lot of people what their view of meaning in life is. 
Um, and so you've gotten a lot of individual answers, but I'm not sure what is the conception that you're working with when you're asking people this? What is the conception of meaning you have in mind? Well, that's the thing I'm pretty agnostic about. I mean, when I ask people what gives your life meaning, it's like whatever they say. I, you know, I mean, I, 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 it's an interesting question. I mean, when we say, does your life have meaning? I guess we mean at a minimum, do you consider it worth living? And I think most of us mean sources of, uh, well, sources of gratification that go beyond the most crude, sensual forms of gratification, right? I think that's kind of implied. Um, beyond that, it's it's an interesting um, question. And, and I think- okay, I know we talk, the, the phrase is used all the time, right? Right, right. But I'm different people how mean often different people things. Ask themselves, well, what exactly does the phrase mean? I mean, you know, if you ask me that question, you know, when I hear that question, the first thing I think of is the answer to that question is going to lie in whatever I would, whatever would make me say at the end of my life, if you asked me that I was satisfied, mm -hmm. right? Um, 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 but of course, that's a very complex thing. It may not be one thing. It may be a whole bunch of different things. That, that would have to occur in order for me to say at the end of my life that I've been satisfied. Um, reasons to get up in the morning. Uh, the problem is that you'd have to separate it from all the mundane reasons that there are to get up in the morning. You know, uh, um, I have to go to work because if I don't go to work, I'm not going to be able to pay my mortgage. And then, you know, my kid's going to not be able to so, do this. That, that. Non-compulsory reasons to get up in the morning. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, you almost wonder whether meaning is kind of gratuitous, right, in a way, in, in the sense that it's... Um, it's that dimension of life that's that, that's valuable that 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 makes life seem valuable, um, um, uh, but is not in itself an instrumental. Is not itself instrumental, right? I mean, I, it, it almost sounds like, right? Um, um, is is that what it is? You think you're getting at sort of the the non instrumental goods, um, intrinsic goods? Yeah, I'm thinking. I I think. It almost has to be something not about the self. It, it it almost has to be about some other organism. Partly, you know, it's. I mean, people. I, I mean, at least anthropologically, if you ask people, they say, "Well, my kid, when my kid smiled this morning, that's what gives my life meaning." Or, or uh, I found a, a dog, and br and brought him in and gave him a home. Or, or uh, I was I you know I belong to a basketball league for middle aged men, and uh, and there's a bond you know, win or lose, or, you know, I think there, there are very few people who would give you an answer about meaning in their life that didn't make reference to something other than the self, you know. So it lies in relationships, you think? Yeah, although, although at the same time, you know, I, I, I can imagine people saying, uh, it's when I contemplate a beautiful sunset, you know, and, and that's, and that, but that's outside of you too. I see. That, I see what you're getting at. That yeah. is outside of you, and yet it's gratifying, just as you know, eating a donut is. It, I, I mean, at least they both qualify for the term gratifying. You're not gratifying in the same way, but but there is something that feels more elevated about aesthetic contemplation. And, and you yeah. could argue that that you could argue that maybe that takes you out of yourself in a way that eating a donut doesn't. I don't know, um, but it's a tough, you know. That's why I almost have to be anthropological about it. And, right. and just I'm just wondering if you've, in all these accumulated conversations that you've had, whether you're noticing any common characteristics that you could then tentatively, hesitatingly define this notion of meaning that you're working with. Um, um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, so it was a lot say, of relationships. It sounds like a lot it of relationships. Tends to involve relationships uh, with and other also beauty. It can, and I think it, it, you know, you mentioned uh, feeling satisfied at the end of your life. It, it, I think often involves actually legacy, things you're happy to have left behind, influences you've had that you're happy to have left behind, um, you know, people you're happy to have left behind. Right. Because uh, even accomplishments, I'm thinking about, you know, certainly some people find meanings in certain kinds of, meaning in certain kinds of accomplishments. But typically, the reason that those accomplishments are valued by the person is that they play some role somewhere, right? An accomplishment right. that no one ever knows about and no one ever hears about, it doesn't affect anyone. 
I, I've, ne I've never heard anyone speak of meaning in terms of accomplishment where the accomplishment was understood in that sort of solitary sort of way. Um, um, right. So now, now I have now there are abstract accomplishments that don't in and of themselves maybe so much involve other people. For example, I've had I think journalists say, well, when I feel I have just clarified things, just advanced the cause of truth, to me, that's meaningful and it's something I will be happy to have left behind. Now, of course, if you ask them to flesh it out, they would say, I think truth is good for people. I think truth is good for society. Right. Um, but but they don't have to be interacting with people in the course of doing this thing that gives them meaning. Not directly, but ultimately the reason why they value the tr this thing right. is because of some effect that's going to have, some role it's going to play, some, some uh, you, you know, something... Yeah, no, I I agree with you. I think I think that uh, that that it does meaning does seem to more often you know nine times out of ten when you talk to me about it, it does involve something outside of themselves, their relationship to something outside of themselves. Uh, uh, um, I I think I think so. So it's a social. It's 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 probably in many ways a social. Now now interestingly, there there are people there are uh, theistic people who might define it essentially in relationship to God, which is in relationship to another being, you know, doing God's will. Yeah. Or, you know, but come to think of it, I mean, there's also the question of alignment with moral truth, even if you don't believe in a God. And I, I think a lot of, I, I, I think that figures for a lot of people. Because I find even, you know, more mundane things um, that aren't, that we wouldn't speak of in terms of meaning of life, I find very difficult to care about if they don't involve others. I mean, even, you know, I'm now middle-aged, and so uh, the issue of my physical health is constantly coming up, and I find it very difficult to care about it that much <laughs> if I'm not thinking about it in relationship to my daughter uh, and whether I'm going to be there for various important things that are going to happen in her life as she grows up, yeah. uh, whether I'm going to leave, leave my wife widowed at a young, too young of an age. Right. You know, in other words, I find it very, if it's just a matter of self-improvement, I find it very hard to motivate myself to do it. I mean, most of the self-improvement I do um, is motivated by at least some interest in the social connection that I have to other people. That's interesting. Um, and I don't know if you found that with others. Um, that, I that would think that varies tremendously. There are certainly people who worry about their health so that they will be able to attract a, a new sex partner Friday night. I mean, so 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 it's like there are people. But that's still who, though, but that still is. That's not just doing it for yourself, right? Well, we I could. Mean, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, <laughs> and I think that that varies from person to person too. Um, but uh, the uh, yeah, no, there's nothing inherently wrong with that being a motivating force. I do. I do think. Uh, there are people who do that in a predatory way, though, which I would not yeah, yeah. applaud. Um, the uh, so it's. I mean, now let me say a little more because I I, I left the uh, the purpose thing very abstract. But in terms of um, why I find this interesting, it, it does matter that um, I mean, well, a couple of elements. First of all, life is sentient. I mean, I think we would probably agree, right, that sentience, subjective experience, is a prerequisite for meaning. I, I, I mean, in the in the yes. sense that, yes, I mean, nothing we're talking about could could be the case without subjective experience. I don't, I don't, I don't believe it's intelligible to speak of something being meaningful or having significance without it having significance to someone, right? Right. I don't it, think that believe that things can be significance independent of someone to whom they are significant. Right. right. I mean, if you imagine yeah. one of us like behaving just as we do in the sense of being able to go around and deal with the real world and even utter sentences and even in a sense comprehend them, but without subjective experience of comprehension, the way a computer might. Um, and you imagine that person staring at a sunset, but not having a subjective experience of beauty. I don't, we probably wouldn't say that's meaningful. We, we, and for that matter, we would probably say if somebody walked up and destroyed that being, that would not be immoral in the sense that we now think of it as immoral to destroy a being, because you're not destroying the capacity for pleasure. You know, you're not. So, so, so I mean, I would say that the subjective experience is, is kind of a prerequisite both for meaning and for morality as we tend to mean it. Yeah, the morality part's a bit trickier. I mean, I'd have to think through about, but I, 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 on the first blush, I would say yes, 
I mean, even moral theories that are completely the opposite of each other, like utilitarianism or Kantianism, if you look at the, the basis upon which morality rests, it still has to do with the selfhood of other people, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Kant, it's the fact of their selfhood, and, 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 and in the case of utilitarianism, it's one of the chief aspects of selfhood, which is the capacity for pain and pleasure. So, I mean, I would agree with you that um, I, I'd have to think about it a little bit to see if I think it's an essential dimension of morals. Um, it's certainly an essential dimension of meaning and significance. Indeed, I don't think that those concepts are intelligible other right. than from a perspective. And so what I'd say about that is two things. First of all, biological evolution well, it seems very good at generating more and more complex organisms, not in a literally inexorable sense, but in a highly probabilistic sense. And, and, and this biological complexity seems to be correlated with degree of sentience. I mean, especially when you start talking about nerve cells and stuff. So I would say biological evolution is a machine for generating meaning. And that's if subjective, if, if subjective experience in itself imparts the capacity for meaning to life, I would say biological evolution is a machine that's very good at generating the capacity for meaning. Um, that's an interesting fact, if true. Um, and then in kind of human cultural evolution, uh, and I'd argue that any intelligent species likely to emerge from biological evolution would have started inventing technologies and in some sense followed the kind of path we followed. But anyway, I've argued in, in non-zero that, um, the, uh, the trajectory of social evolution has kind of entailed a certain kind of erratic moral progress, which is just what Peter Singer described in his book, The Expanding Circle, which is that, you know, in 500 BCE, members of one Greek city-state considered members of another Greek, other Greek city-state subhuman, but then they, they, time passes, they decide, no, all Greeks are human, it's the Persians who aren't human, more time passes, and, you know, you get to a point where the, you know, the modern cosmopolitan perspective, which, you know, most people you and I know hold, <clears throat> is that people, regardless of race, creed, or color, are uh, deserving of decent treatment. They have basic rights and that's real progress. And, and, you know, Peter's argued, other people have argued, uh, and, and I argued in non-zero, A, that, that it's a case. I emphasized a particular dynamic that I thought was driving it in non-zero that, uh, that made it seem kind of, if erratic, a kind of inexorable thing. But anyway, if you accept that argument, that's another interesting feature of the directionality. It has a moral, direction. So, so if you buy this, you've got like this giant machine that's a few billion years old and is still unfolding, but it seems to have the property of creating meaning. And by the way, nobody has a good explanation of why sentience exists. I'm sorry. Nobody has a good and compelling explanation. And uh, I mean, Dan Dennett kind of thinks he does, but what he why actually means... Why exists or of what it is? Which, which, which is it that we no, don't... No, actually, why... why, why you would expect it to be something that emerges from natural selection. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and I, and I, uh, I mean, I'd refer people to a conversation on meaning of life TV I had with David Chalmers and actually with, uh, Steve Pinker's wife, uh, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein. Both I watched Western. that one too. Yeah. Yeah. About this, about how challenging philosophers are finding it. And philosophers and scientists to really, uh, come up with an explanation. But anyway, so for like, for reasons we don't understand the capacity for meaning, is in part is generated by this machine. Um, a certain kind of, I would say, movement toward moral truth, at least along one dimension. That's not the, the only machine dimension. being the biological yeah, machine. The whole or? evolutionary system on this planet, biological and then cultural evolution. The cultural evolution that uh, is sustained by an intelligent species. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so these. This is why I think it's a. It's. You know, and I could get more into the de the structural details of the system that I think are reason to would be reason to suspect purpose, regardless of whether it had this kind of moral these dimensions of morality and meaning, or these moral and and, and meaningful or or whatever. Um, but I think they're really interesting. Okay, they they are technically I don't think you'd have to have these to argue that the machine itself has hallmarks of some hallmarks of purpose. But maybe they strengthen the argument. I don't know. In, in any event, they they if you want to move beyond the 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 claim that there's evidence of purpose into speculation about whoa, well, what would the purpose be? I think they're relevant. Um, yeah. So I mean, the one thing I think that happens a lot, and and 
I'm not saying you're doing this, but I think an awful lot of people commit all sorts of versions of the genetic fallacy when they talk about this stuff. And so genetic, the genetic fallacy, Uh, right? What's that? Um, So it's the fact that the fact that something came from a certain place doesn't mean that that certain place explains what the thing is. In other words, um, the fact that, um, Oh, in the sense of Genesis, you mean genetic? Yeah, the fact that we all come, yeah, it's just one of the, it's just a shorthand. It's, you know, there's all these logical fallacies that you learn, you know, the ad hominem fallacy, the, 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 the fallacy of composition. The, these are all things that you, you know, you learn and you teach in intro uh, critical thinking courses. And so I'm just used to talking this way. Um, but the fact that, the fact that um, culture comes, culture only occurs in biological creatures doesn't mean that biology tells us any has anything interesting to tell us about culture or that culture is biological right and in other words the fact that um um you know i'm an anti-reductionist a very very strong anti-reductionist in that i don't think that um talk at the level of of um that talk at the level that we would call intentionality can be reduced to any more fundamental kind of talk, either the language of biology or the language of chemistry, certainly not the language of physics. And so while it's true that the machine, as you call it, nature created, um, is responsible for creating creatures that then go on to create culture and society, doesn't mean that in trying to understand culture and society, biology is going to tell me very much if if, if anything. And, um, And so I'm just not nearly as interested in the biology um, because my interest is in, is in society and culture. This is why I have very little use for sort of ev- psych um, uh, evolutionary ethics. I think that they all engage in a lot of versions of the genetic fallacy as well as a lot of category uh, mistakes. They trade in a lot of category mistakes um, and can give the false illusion of having, of, of, of having explained something when you really, really haven't. I also think that they they often can tempt us to certain sorts of deterministic attitudes um, because of how we think of nature um, that I think are not useful uh, in talking about uh, matters that operate at the level of culture and society. Um, And so even if nature is purposeful, I don't think that that can be therefore straightforwardly translated into any of the sort of really substantive things we want to say about human culture and society and morality and stuff like that. Um, I, I think I may agree. I mean, I mean, I certainly, I mean, I, there, there are things you said I think I disagree with. I mean, I think if, if you're saying that, that the biologically evolved kind of nature, so to speak, of an organism, I would say human nature, for example, is not relevant to the kind of culture it propagates, I would certainly disagree. I mean, and, and I should emphasize, when I say culture, I'm not talking about just the Museum of Modern Art. I, I'm talking about all information transmitted by people that is not genetic. So that means yeah. technology, religion, yeah. politics, yeah. everything. And just one example is, uh, you know, the evolution of information technology is a really important part of my uh, argument about how the growth in in the scope of social organization was very likely, but because I think for one thing, uh, the evolution of information technology was likely. Well, why was it so likely? Because people are creatures that want to communicate with each other, and they want to play non-zero sum games with each other as to as much uh, personal profit as possible. And that means that if there's a new technology that would allow you to play non-zero sum games with people farther and farther away and engage in trade or political alliance or whatever. You will, you will try to invent that technology and you will use it and it will become part of society. So uh, now you can imagine creatures that aren't like that, that, that don't, uh, aren't so social. There are creatures that aren't very social, but our biologically evolved nature is to be social and to play both zero sum and non-zero sum games with one another. But I think we have specific mechanisms in our brain for doing those two things. And that does help explain the trajectory of cultural evolution. Yeah, I mean, you know, this this would probably take us down a tangent that that we don't want to go down, and and would get very complicated. Um, um, I, I I'm going to link to some in the in the in the links. I'm going to link to a number of discussions 
um, uh, by contemporary philosophers who roughly come from the orientation I come from, which is a roughly Wittgensteinian orientation, about whether there's any fruitful sense in speaking of um, that we are brains or that people are brains or that brains are persons or that personhood is in the brain. Um, I, I just, I think that we misunderstand how these concepts are used in ordinary language and we treat them in a way that actually mis misunderstands what their nature is. Um, I don't think a person is a thing. I think the word person denotes any number of a, a large number of, of capacities. Um, uh, and so I don't know that you would ever find the person somewhere because the person is not a thing. It's a set of dispositions. Um, um, I don't know that I think that the, that, that you know, I would say the same thing about a self or about a mind. Um, 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 you know, I, I think there's a basic problem in taking the kind of ways we talk about ourselves and our lives in ordinary language and trying to map this onto some sort of scientific set of descriptions, um, I almost think that those, I think that those are almost always wrong, um, precisely because the ordinary language concepts that we're using are much more complicated uh, uh, and, and have different uses depending on different contexts um, and can't be neatly translated into a kind of a, a, a biological uh, language. I don't even think psychology can be reduced to biology. Um, um, for this reason, um, you, do I think, you, you do think, I assume that a people are evolved organisms and yes. B, the brain yes. orchestrates behavior. Yes. But look, the brain, all, look, the brain, let's just put it this way. People will often say things like, um, you know, my brain performed various calculations. Right. Um, and the argument is, well, you know, uh, I couldn't calculate without the brain. Right. Well, you also couldn't walk without the brain, but nobody says that it's the brain that's walking, right? It's the person that's walking. Um, walking is something that people do. It's not something that brains do. Um, people have brains, right? Um, and so I think that there's a, a, a real confusion when we cross from the sort of the ordinary language framework in which we talk about uh, ourselves at that sort of level of description. And then when we talk about ourselves at a sort of a, Phys as a physical science level of description. So, yes, of course we're, or we're, or we're evolved creatures. No, I don't believe in any special substances or in separate dualisms or anything like that. But I, that doesn't mean that the language that's suitable for talking about morals, uh, politics, etc., can be translated into or reduced into some lower level language um, in terms of neurons and uh, uh, genes and things like that. that that's I, that's I, I, where I balk. Right. Yeah, I think I would. I, I, well, I think I would join you in a certain amount of that balking, but think it's not actually fatal to the argument I'm making. But I think you're also yeah. right that this is probably a, a, a yeah, tangent it's, it's, we should say for another right. day. Let, let me just because uh, a fair amount of time has gone by. Let me mention one other thing, uh, just to try to make this a little more intelligible, make it more intelligible to people why I am interested in this. Uh, so, in my That's view, a good, I mean, it's a good idea, Bob, because. People, what inspired this comment of mine was that people are going after, are trying to figure out your motives. Right. So it's probably a good idea. Right. They, think it's like, <laughs> they think it's like to get funded. And I mean, here's the thing for some, <laughs> a quick Which tangent really on that. Right? As you and I know, uh, if you want to, if you want to make a living thinking and writing about ideas, you face a, a financial challenge. Yeah. So you can do what, you know, it's hard to get the kind of job you have. And if you don't have that kind of job, it's even harder. Yep. You need funding. Now, there's two ways to get funding. One is to find funders who support what you are interested in doing anyway. And then right. the other is to bend your your uh, aspirations or interests in right. the direction of the funder. Well, happily... Or, or, or prostitution. Right. right. Well, that is... Yeah, yeah. Or, well, or prostitution <laughs> metaphorically or literally. But but, but my point is, I, I all, all of my core interests, all of this stuff that we're talking about now, almost literally all of it is in my first book, Three Sciences yeah, of God, 1988, stuff for years. Long back, back in the days when a writer could actually make money selling books. And yeah. I didn't have any, you know, long before I had any philanthropic funds. So anyway, we, we, we uh, need to, that. but the point I wanted to get at is um, in my view, and this is an argument I've made in both non-zero and in the evolution of God is 
<clears throat> this moral evolution, you know, evolution of the kind of the circle of moral consideration saying, OK, it's not just members of my ethnic group who are like, OK, and so on is, you know, a it's been driven largely by pragmatic interests. It's like, oh, I can do business with this person in one sense or another, not necessarily in the, in the sense of commerce, but, you know, we can play a non zero sum game, etc. Anyway, I've argued that this expansion of moral uh, scope has been essential to the growth of um, social organization, you know, and that now as society is approaching the global level of social organization, in other words, the technology is here that would permit us to have a cohesive global civilization, almost in some sense a single community. We don't have it yet, but in my view, getting to that point, which seems challenging at this moment of history, given all the tribalism that's going on, but um, getting to that point would require more in the way of this moral progress. Uh, you know, we, we would all have to get better at, for one thing, putting ourselves in the shoes of people in very different circumstances from ours, understanding the perspective of people in different cultures and so on, which to my, to my mind constitutes moral progress. But in any way, I've made the argument that if we are going to move to, to a, a more harmonious global civilization, as opposed to descending into chaos, we are going to have to make moral progress and expand, you know, what's sometimes called the moral imagination, this ability to put yourself in the shoes of others, not just in the sense of feeling their pain, but also in the sense of just understanding how the world looks to them and why they might do things that initially strike you as strange. Um, so, first of all, that is itself an interesting feature of the system uh, as, as I see it. But secondly, this gets to how it actually helps impart meaning to my life. This is this is uh, one of my main mi missions. I mean, this is I'm interested in trying to convince people of the virtue of expanding moral imagination and the importance to civilization of doing it. And well, I mean, when I said virtue, I mean that in a kind of a literal sense. I think I think it it moves you toward moral truth uh, to get better at this. Right. And I think it's essential for humanity. So at least in my case, this whole intellectual exercise does help give my life meaning in this specific sense, which I wouldn't expect everyone to do with this worldview by any means. I, w I wouldn't, but, but, but that's. No, and that may look, and it, it, that's very, A, it's very clear. And B, it renders very intelligible a lot of the things that you do and that you're interested in. Um, I think sometimes people also get angry at you and my view quite unfairly they, for, for, they think, they think that you're um, um, going too far in trying to uh, get people to um, back off of all the anti-Islamic and anti-Islamist sort of talk, um, and and you get a lot of very free, angry free speech purists and angry. So, but if what your aim is overarching is to try to, if you're convinced that moral progress involves the developing of less and less of a zero sum attitude. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 and to think more uh, in this other way, then of course that's going to be your view, right? Because because you're you're going to be against anything that's divisive in this sort of way, and that sort of creates creates uh, antipathies where we where we should be trying to uh, and views people as in a sense um, it's either him or me. Um, uh, so, so I mean. I, I think that a lot of what you do is intelligible within this context, right? A lot of the work you've done. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I'm certainly for free speech in the sense that the government should allow us to exercise it. But right. at the same time, I mean, just to use the example you've hit upon of free speech and, and uh, you know, uh, the whole Islamic issue. You know, I would argue that... Uh, before you go march down the streets of Paris with signs saying, we are Charlie Hebdo, or I am Charlie Hebdo, at least ask you, and again, you should certainly have the right to do that. It's, to me, it's not a free speech issue I'm even arguing about, because yeah. the speech should be free. It's not a matter of law. You're saying, should we do this? It's, it's a question of norms and speech codes, and societies have always had these, and they're essential, the truth is. But, but, but you know, just enforced by norm and public opinion. But, um, but, but what I would say is just at least go through the exercise of what I'm calling moral imagination and ask yourself, if you were a Muslim in Paris, would you necessarily read that message in the way you're intending it? Would you say, oh, well, they just mean that Charlie Hebdo should be free right. 
to, to, you know, to express these ideas without getting killed. Or when they say, I am Charlie Hebdo, are they saying, I love this magazine that insulted your prophet? There's right. a good chance that a lot of Muslims are reading it that way. And all I'm saying is, do the exercise. And if you still think it's a good idea to hold that sign as opposed to a sign that says, I support the right to free speech without being killed, right. then go ahead. But would yeah. you please get out of your own head long enough to yeah. understand how the messages you're sending are perceived by other people. But the getting out of your head is crucial to what you're talking about, non-zero-sum game approaches, right? Because part of that involves thinking of it as either me or him, right? Uh, and, and that involves it partly being wrapped up entirely with me and not thinking about him at all, right? right. I mean, he becomes sort of an object over there, uh, and, 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 and I'm... I am I am privy to my own internal life, but it never occurs to me that he has an internal life too, right? Um, right. Uh, so, and, so, I mean, in a way, this gets back to essentialism in the sense that, um, look, a terrorist who wants to kill you does have a zero sum relationship with you. Uh, you know, it, 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 but well, well, two things. First of all, perceiving a relationship as non zero sum, I think, does open up the moral imagination. It's like if there's somebody you can do a business deal with, you're, you're just eager to embrace their, you know, it's like, tell me, what's your religion? Oh, I love it. I mean, it, that's just like natural. It happens naturally. Yep. Whereas if you, if, if, a, if it's a terrorist trying to kill you, the, the opposite instincts are, are invoked. And that's by nature, I would say. And if you then kind of loosely extrapolate to all other Muslims or to many other Muslims, then that's engaging in a kind of essentialism, I think, you know, attributing an essence to Islam, uh, that in this case, a bad one, that, that I think impedes the moral imagination. And that's why I think we have to be um, careful about that. Just quickly, you know, I mentioned mindfulness meditation. One reason for my interest in that, not the only one, I think it's very good at opening up the moral imagination, just as a practical matter. Um, interesting, interesting that spending time alone inside your own mind has the effect of almost the opposite. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a common misconception That's that it's a self-indulgent thing, I think. Yeah, it, because yeah. what it really does when it works is help you get a certain distance from the very feelings and inclinations and thoughts that are keeping you self-centered. Yeah, that's interesting. You, you, that's... It helps you not you might say not identify with them, although some people would uh, argue that language. So this thing though about progress, I mean, so let's, let me just say a couple of things about this. I mean, first of all, I, I share your desire for it. I think that your analysis in terms of zero sum games is I think useful. I think, I think that certainly it, it makes sense. Um, I'm not convinced that it is, in any way, and I don't, I'm not saying you're saying this, but but I've gotten this impression sometimes. Um, I don't think in any way it's inexorable. I don't think in any way it's inevitable. I don't think in any way it's the result of some. Um, I, I I don't buy the direct the directionality that you're talking about as being in nature, right? That because that if we even if we grant nature has purpose in this very limited sense that you that you that we talked about, that somehow you can get out of that that it's pointing towards this and that's pointing towards that and that's pointing to a more moral society. I don't think that I I, I don't I, I'm dubious very dubious about that story, and I don't know how strong you intend to intend to be telling that story or whether you're not telling that story at all. And I'm, mis I'm misinterpreting. Um, well, the argument made non-zero, and it is like a book length argument, but um, was that, uh, well, two things. I, I mean, that, that, that first of all, historically, there is this correlation between the expansion of social organization, you know, hunter-gatherer village, chiefdom, ancient state, you know, empire, and now, now modern kind of loosely interconnected global society. There is a correlation between that and this, you know, some degree of moral progress along this particular dimension of morality. I, I make that argument. B, I argue that actually it, it has been pretty close to inexorable up to now. Uh, but the things that made it inexorable, once, once the, so, the level of uh, social organization is the global level, once you're talking about a kind of in some sense a single social unit, I don't mean necessarily a world government, but a fairly cohesive um, 
social unit, um, then there's reason. Then, then the the specific analytical reasons there were to think that it's been inexorable up to a point. Some of them no longer apply. So, so I certainly I know this is not exactly what you're saying, but I just want to qualify my own uh, argument of of kind of something like inexorability by saying that once we get up to this point, <clears throat> um, things are far less assured than they have been, and. Uh, you know, in the old days, civilization collapses. There's another one to pick up the pieces. Pretty soon, you know, things, you know, things advance. But, uh, and also one thing that congealed societies was the the uh, existence of enemy societies. Okay? We don't have that once we're at the global level. So there's various things that, um, various reasons to believe this is a uniquely precarious time. Although there have always been collapses of societies. And if you're living in it, and there's not much assurance in knowing that a millennium later, you know, you'll be in better shapes. It's always a bad time. But but beyond that, there's reason to think that once you get to the global level, it's just an inherently hard step to take. I guess that, you know, the two things I'm doubtful of is one, that one can in any clean, clean clear, seamless way go from the minimal purpose that we've talked about with respect to nature all the way up to this idea of moral progress as being, in a sense, um, a, a physical process, ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. a, a process that, that, that we can ascribe, ultimately, to the biological uh, level of description. Um, um, part of my reason for being dubious about this isn't just about my skepticism about purpose and nature, but it's partly also because I could give a, an account of this progress in terms purely of the history of ideas not natural history not but the history of ideas um and it's not clear to me unless you want to be sort of very deterministic mm -hmm. that you're going to want to give sort of sociobiological accounts of the history of ideas i mean people i know i'm certainly sure that there's plenty of people who would love to do that and i would be the love to be the one who skewers it because i just i find that sort of stuff usually when you examine it closely it turns out to be quite glib um, I, I think much of it is, uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I, but I don't think the two are unconnected. I don't think, but, but I, I think much of it is. I mean, you know, in a way, it's, this is a Hegel Marx question. Yeah, you know? my, my other skepticism is, yeah, and I've always been dubious of that sort of thing as well. My, my other I mean, directionality of history and all that. No, other no, but, thing, I mean, I, but I mean, the difference between talking about it in terms of ideas, uh, which yeah. are part of the system, and talking about it in material terms is kind of yeah. a Hegel Marx yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the other thing I'm kind of skeptical about is, I'm not all at all convinced of the moral progress that everybody's congratulating ourselves for. Um, uh, I, I find Pinker completely unpersuasive. Um, um, and um, um, I, more than unpersuasive, I mean, I've been, I've been pretty um, satirical in the way I've treated him and some of the things I've written about him. Um, I just, A, I don't know that I believe that we're more moral, but B, I know for sure that the kind of evidence that he brings to bear wouldn't be sufficient to prove it, right? I mean, in other words, um, he confuses a decline in violence with an increase in morality that seems to me to be obviously fallacious um, and, um, um, and reductive in a way that, that uh, very crudely reductive. And um, so I'm not at all persuaded that that we're more moral now. Um, yeah, that, uh, it, the, the violence thing isn't so much what I'm talking about. And he makes a number of arguments in his book, The Better Angels Are Nature, yeah, that aren't yes. exactly what I'm talking about. But he does include discussion of this idea of the expanding moral circle. And yeah. I know, wasn't attributing him to you. I wasn't saddling yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, no. I'm just using him as a prominent example of someone yeah. who believes in moral progress as unproblematic. And, and you had him on recently. And so yeah. that's why I bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you're you're convinced that we're in a clear, demonstrable sense that the moral progress arc has been like this. No, there's there's backsliding. Um, maybe we're undergoing some now, but on balance, has there been net progress? Yeah, apparently it's literally the case that members of one Greek city state <laughs> used to consider members of another Greek city state subhuman. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, you, don't, you don't have to go back very far. You don't even have to go back a hundred years right. to find that on a mass, much larger scale, right? Right. So, yeah, how are we, how are we better than them? How are we better than who? With, than the ancient Greek city states, with respect to that one characteristic. 
Well, do you consider any ethnic group subhuman? No, but but but, well, that's, but, but, that, but then you're better. <laughs> I I maybe I am, but you're, we're talking about us as a whole. The well, most no, civilized, evenly, the look, most civilized country in Europe last century. Look, this, this exterminated worldview, a half of a population of a of, of a people on the grounds that they were subhuman. I, I think this worldview is uh, most prevalent in uh, countries that are. Um, cosmopolitan, uh, not just in the sense of attitude, I mean, that would be a redundancy to say that, but in the sense of interconnected, economically, you know, they tend to be uh, economically, technologically advanced and interconnected with the world. Um, so uh, I think that's- they, they tend to be the most moral, the least like the Greek citizens? I think you find, I think you find a cosmopolitan attitude uh, most commonly in countries that are uh, richly interconnected economically with other countries, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, look, you mean like I, you mean like Weimar Germany? Um, <laughs> I mean, come on! I mean, this is well. There are exceptions, but that was actually at a time when economically it was far from richly integrated with the world. There was a zero sum relationship with it economically in the rest of the world. It was being um, punished for World War One. And so, in a way, that's that's. I would say that's not glaringly inconsistent with what I'm saying. I mean, we only just got rid of Jim Crow a few decades ago. Uh, yeah, but it. Well, we were late to the game, first of all. Um, and look, we're living at a time when there's not a. Uh, I don't think there's a single. I mean, okay, except with may, maybe ISIS, which is a recent thing that I don't think is gonna is the hallmark of the of things to come. Um. An no, age when no, I think no, no, no I think nation, a, no a, nation explicit, explicitly allows slavery. That's radical and revolutionary. No, I, you can't look, just take I, that kind of thing for granted. No, That's absolutely, unprecedented. Absolutely. But look, I mean, this, but this is where I guess my objection comes into it. And that is, if the claim is we have improved morally in a number of specific ways, that's uncontroversial. Oh. If... I thought you were but, saying it wasn't, but, but no, 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 no. My, but my problem is in characterizing the entire arc as one of a betterment, a moral betterment. I think in some ways we become better, in some ways we become worse. That's totally it, compatible with my worldview that in some ways we become worse. I'm only talking about one dimension. What's dimension? What's the dimension? Uh, Please to say it again. Just the, to be the, the 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 granting of. Uh, the kind zero stat human status and, and the grant and, and the and the and and kind of a basic respect for people regardless of race creed or color or nash or nation at least in principle at least as a thing you say that is itself progress yes yeah, so with respect to yeah with respect to the, what you just said race creed or nation etc i ex i agree we have become more um uh culturally tolerant in that sense, okay. um, ethnically culturally You see how that's the part that's essential to my argument. That's the part that's tied in structurally to the expansion of social organization. And right. that's the kind of thing I think we need to work on further to sustain, you know, our... But your claim is then not that we are more moral generally, that, 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 no, there, is an arc of, that there is an arc of general moral progress that we can trace not, that maps onto... I, I would not say general, not so much because I can... I, I could name, Pink, Pinker is saying that, right? Uh, I mean, I'd let him speak, but but he's he he is certainly talking more broadly than I'm talking. And it, Singer has said that. I mean, Singer, I read Singer's but, review of Pinker's book. Yeah. They both think we're getting more moral. Period. Yeah. Not with respect to A and B. Um, we're getting more moral. Period. And that's I have a problem. No, with that. I, I would not say. I mean, morality has too many dimensions, and and okay. and, and and so on, and and. Uh, but I mean, so we, we've been talking an hour and 13 well, minutes. We should yeah. probably, but let me just say two things quickly. Yeah. The, the, um, when I said you could talk about purpose, uh, without getting into moral direction and, and, uh, consciousness. I mean, one thing I'm saying is if you were just like looking at planet earth from another planet and you saw it in time lapse and you saw that like, okay, there's this bare strand of self-replicating material several billion years ago and it, and it, and it creates, you know, it carries biological organization to the level of cell, multicellular creatures, society, so on. And a few billion years later, you've got a giant global brain, the Internet. You, you would go, whoa, that's not more like a rock than a pocket watch. That, that, that's kind of the, the, the nature of that argument. I just wanted to, I, I hadn't put it that way, but I, I think that's part of the argument. Um, the, yeah. other th the, the other thing I want to say is, 
um, thank you for indulging me. The, uh, you know, because I, 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 um, I don't like to use my own kind of platform to, uh, to do nothing but talk about my own ideas. But at the, at the same time, I think I secretly lust for it. So this has been gratifying. And you know what would be um, an interesting form of reciprocation since uh, you said you're very Wittgensteinian in your worldview. And I know enough about him to be very intrigued, but not uh, all that much. Uh, maybe we could do one of your shows where I interrogate you about Wittgenstein. Sure. And, sure. Um, yeah, and, you can, I... and you can tell me why he matters to you. Yeah, sure. It'd okay. Be... Be a pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Any any final word you want to have? I'll shut up from here on. No, I, I um, you know, there's there's so much here. You know, I'd love to talk to you just about moral progress. I would love to talk to you just about this idea of purpose and nature more. Um, um, I I I do think that you just maybe don't quite give enough credit to the extent to which the order you're ascribing lies as much in your perception of what you're looking at than in the thing as it is a thing in itself, right? In other, in other, in other words, I, I'm, always, I'm always checking to make sure that what I'm ascribing is, is really in the object and not as a result of my organizing of the object in perception right. or in, in contemplation or whatever. And I just, uh, some of the ways you talk, and this may just be the fact that you're not a professional philosopher, so you're not trained to be so fucking careful, right? Um, and I may be, I may be nitpicking, but there, there are certain things you said that just make me wonder whether you're ascribing to the thing characteristics that really belong to your framing right. of the thing, right? Um, um, well, that's that, always that's, a danger. Yeah. I mean, that's why you put these things in the form of arguments and whole books and try. And if yeah. I critique. In a way, my main point is that this is something you can argue about. Dawkins was right. You can look at a physical system and yeah. say, does it have the hallmarks of purpose? But but I, I don't doubt that that there are things I'd like to read into it. And for that reason, uh, no one should take my word for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate it, Bob. I really enjoyed this. And, so did uh, I. I do hope we can talk again uh, about other things. Yeah. Uh, you're a busy man, of course. <laughs> we all are, but uh, but that gig at Union seems like it's going really well. Um, you're getting good programming out of it too. I mean, a lot of these blogging heads things that are coming out, you wouldn't be doing if you weren't over there, right? I mean, yeah, I think that's true. Well, both I've done I've done um, some just with Union faculty, but also um, those several that we did uh, 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 in the fall with like with Steve Pink or with David Chalmers and so on. Those are live events, but they've been here on the website as well. Are you going to connect? Are you going to do anything? One of your people at union contacted me to try and get some, to suggest some names at the Jewish theological seminary. Are you going to be doing anything with people over there? You know, they're right across the street from you. That, I know that is yeah. for a panel discussion. I'm trying to set up. Okay. And so we'll, well let me know, let me know how that goes. I because, will. Uh, and uh, thank you for um, for indulging me again. And and I do want to uh, let's let's make it Wittgenstein, okay? Okay, my let's pleasure. Let's make it Wittgenstein date. I'll email you. All righty. Okay, thanks. <laughs>